NASA science report is a special summary of events leading to the Voyager 2 spacecraft's encounter with the planet Uranus. The programs originate live from the facilities of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and are authorized by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The NASA science report, Voyager 2 at Uranus, is one of a series of public information programs designed to keep the public informed of space exploration. And sure enough, it's the darkest of the satellite. That's sort of poetic justice that it turns out that way. And that was known when they were named? No, no. <laughs> but it, you know, nature was cooperative. Features keep showing up, and there are bright and dark spots. And some of our younger people are very tempted. They've looked at pictures of the Jupiter satellites and the Saturn satellites and the Mars and the Venus, and they say, aha, a ray crater. And uh, we look at it, and they say, spectacular rays. You know, and there's little tiny fuzzy lines. So we say, you know, later we'll see those better. The thing that's fascinating is Miranda. Just a couple of days ago, we weren't even sure it was round. You know? Really? Well, the pictures looked sort of oblong. We said, well, it's really round. That's going to come in. And sure enough, it turns out to be spherical the way it should be. And then we saw spot. And then they said, well, this is going to be like Nemus. You know, it had such an enormous impact crater, it may have broken the satellite apart. Well, today we saw that feature, and it looks sort of square. It looks like <laughs> sort of a square hole. And so we're not quite sure what that's going to turn out to be. But we'll see it 40 times better in just the next day. So nobody wants to say, I know what that hole in the ground is. Not when within a couple of days it's all going to be revealed at that much resolution. Al, thank you very much. So Uranus was discovered more than 200 years ago. That's considered a recent discovery. All the other planets, except Neptune and Pluto, were visible and known to the ancients. It took a musician and an amateur astronomer using a telescope to find Uranus. His name was William Herschel, and George Fenneman talked with scientist Barry, Gary Hunt about him. Gary, I understand that Uranus is the first planet discovered using modern technology. All the other planets were discovered by ancient man. Why don't we talk about the man who discovered Uranus? Yes, he really was one of the greatest, should we say, amateur astronomers of all time. Hanoverian, born in Germany, a musician who decided he wanted to come to England. And having made one visit one year, he came the following year and joined orchestras in the town of Richmond in Yorkshire in northern England. And then finally he moved to Bath, which is one of the spa towns discovered by the Romans, which was a major center of entertainment and activity in Britain at that time. And he, there he set up his work, he carried on his orchestral activities, teaching music, and as a hobby, his work in astronomy. What year was this, 17? This is in the, year, the 1750s, he started to move to Bath, and he became very active. And how he got really into astronomy was one night he was out in the street, King Street in Bath, observing the moon. And a gentleman tapped him on the shoulder, one Dr. Watson, uh, who was a very distinguished British scientist, and said, can I observe the moon through your telescope? And they became very close friends, and Watson introduced him to the Bath Literary, Literary Society, which was the local organization where people came to discuss scientific and cultural activities. And then from this, he built his own... He brought his own telescope. He would entertain uh, people to dinner. He could, in fact, invite you and I to dinner one night. And after dinner, he would say, well, come and help me with some astronomy. Come and grind some mirrors with me. He'd have <laughs> mirror grinding parties. And uh, he carried on uh, his astronomy, cataloging the stars in the sky. And then one night in March of 1781, he observed one particular object and saw it on three consecutive nights. This is then on the 13th of March. He was convinced it was the same object, which he thought was a comet. And he then took these observations, wrote the paper, which Dr. Watson presented to both the Literary Society and later in 1781 to the Royal Society, when he then became quite convinced it wasn't a comet, but in fact a planet. Well, did he discover this uh, ahead of everybody else because he had these parties at his house? He built a better telescope? He Why had, was he able to see it? He had an extremely good, uh, extremely good telescope. And in fact, later on, as he became more renowned, in fact, the king heard about him, this distinguished amateur who was doing excellent work, and the king summoned him to London. So he came with a seven-foot telescope, star catalogues, and everything else he discovered for an audience with the king. And before the king would really give him any patronage, he said, well, you must get the Astronomer Royal to check your telescope. And they were convinced that his telescope was far better than the professionals that they were using. And in fact, 
as a result of this, George III, who had previously been rather more occupied with the battles of his colonial states in America and other issues before really worrying about Herschel, decided that he would actually support Herschel in his work and gave him a, a civil pension of £200 a year, which in those days wasn't a bad sum of money. And also the Astronomer Royal, the leading professional astronomer, was only getting £300 a year. <laughs> so he wasn't doing very badly. But one of the things he had to do as a consequence of royal patronage was in fact to entertain the people of the court, the king, the queen, the princesses, and so on, with astronomy and what was in the night sky with the aid of his telescope at Windsor. Fascinating. Thank you, Gary. I'm George Fenneman. Light has always been our key to learning about the heavens. That's still true today, even though many of our modern instruments can see light invisible to us. One instrument on Voyager 2 will measure distant starlight as it passes through the rings of Uranus. That measurement is car called a star occultation, and Lonnie Lane is here to tell us about it. What's the instrument you use for that? Brother? It's called a photopolarimeter. It's not the camera. It's no, it's not a camera. Right? It's a very simple device in principle and really in practice. It has a light sensing element that can sense light very, changes in light very quickly, and that data is then uh, digitized and sent to the ground. So you get very, very rapid readings. Very rapid so reading. changes in a hurry. Correct. And so if a ring particle or rock or, or something were to occult, that is, stop the starlight, that changes the signal, and we detect that change. And you sample very, very rapidly and build up a high precision but very narrow trace across the ring or any other material. So you, can you always find a convenient star, nice oh, and no. located? But... Oh, no. At Saturn, we were lucky. We had a few very nice bright ones. At Uranus, there was a real dearth of stars in the sky. We had very few. I think we have an animation of, of, of how this whole thing worked. The, the thing you would have seen if you were on the spacecraft going past Saturn and then the one mm -hmm. we're going to do past Earth. Why don't we run that uh, tape? Here we go right now. And there's a star, I guess, uh, blinking across yeah, right in the was, middle of the shadow of Saturn. That's right. There's, there's a, a star, star blinking on and off. And the little trace on the bottom is the uh, oh, I see graph, light. The the graph on the bottom is what the data would look like. That's right. That's the light that's going through the various rings. There's Cassini division where it's relatively clear, and then the A-ring that was thicker, light level drops. And now we're going to right, no, watch no. one go past, which is right this Right there, this is uh, Cygnus Sagittarius. It's an ultraviolet star, relatively bright, and it clips through the outer two rings, and a long, thin cord then goes across and coming back out again. The unique thing about this particular occultation is it doesn't go across all the rings, but very high spatial resolution, quite unique and unattainable on the ground or in Earth orbit. And this other one that's coming up now? That will be uh, Beta Persei, and that makes a cut through the entire ring system. I don't think we that. picked that one up on the tape. The, the information you got from Saturn revealed an enormously complex structure of the rings there. And extremely dynamic and maybe quite temporal. That is changing its environment over a few years to maybe even a few months. In fact, is there was a radio occultation on Voyager 1, and we found regions in the rings, in, in the C ring, one of the inner major rings of Saturn, that had changed drastically between the time of the radio occultation 10 months earlier and then the stellar occultation from Voyager 2. Do you anticipate anything like that in Uranus, or do you have any way of telling this? Point? Well, the ground has done a very good job in stellar occultations because the geometry... That is the That's how they were found. Upward, they? Correct, okay. but by airplane and by ground studies. Um, then the rings seem to be, at least the scale of the ground, has seen them less dynamic, but they all rotate as semi-rigid rotators, and they each have their own period, and, um, and ellipse or near circular. And we will probe that at very high resolution because one of the major questions is, in the epsilon ring, the outer one, which is relatively thick and broad, uh, does the material accordion as the ring gets wider at apoapsis, the distance part of the orbit, and then compress uniformly as it comes to the narrow part. And we're just lucky enough that the first occultation gets near to the narrow part, the periapse, and the second occultation will cut very close to the apoapse or the distant part. And by comparing those two, we'll look and see, does the internal structure stay constant, which is what one theory requires, or is it jumbled in some way and then reforms? And that requires a whole new mechanism. And also, the similar questions may apply to the other smaller range. That's correct. Bonnie, thank you very much. Thank you. We're receiving more than 200 images a day from Voyager 2. Now, that's considerably less than we got during the earlier encounters of Jupiter and Saturn. And there are two reasons for that. A far greater distance to Uranus, and the constraints the engineers have placed on the spacecraft. Because of the distance to Uranus, it takes a picture two hours and 45 minutes to reach Earth, traveling at the speed of light. Those pictures continue to come in, and the scientists continue to pour over them. And Bill Griffith has more on that.
It's one of the largest satellites in the Iranian system. At 1,630 kilometers across, it's about half the size of our own moon. So far, Voyager's latest photos of Oberon have not really told scientists anything they didn't already know about it from their Earthbound observations. What is known is that it's covered by a thin layer of water ice. But imaging scientist Bob Brown especially pointed out a group of dark spots on its surface. One of the interesting things that we've seen in some of the latest images is this feature here, which uh, has a, quite a dark center and there's a bright area around this. Uh, although the resolution is not uh, extremely good right now, uh, what we're thinking at this time is this is perhaps one of the first craters that we're going to see on Oberon. Uh, the other interesting feature that we see uh, in this low resolution photograph is that uh, there is another feature here which may be a crater and has a dark central area and it has a fair amount of bright material which may have been thrown out uh, when this uh, creator was, was uh, created. Uh, probably uh, what has happened is that uh, when the impact occurred, water, water ice, uh, which is the main constituent of the surfaces of uh, most of the Iranian satellites, uh, was thrown out and that's what we see here. The mystery satellite at this point is Umbriel, which looks like a giant golf ball. It measures roughly 1,000 kilometers across, and it's probably covered by a very thick layer of ice. But it is the darkest satellite in the Uranian system. It reflects only about 12% of the sunlight that hits it. So Dr. Brown says less is known about it. Though we have known for a long time that Umbriel is uh, composed of water ice, it is much darker than the rest of the large satellites, and therefore most of its surface must be covered with dark material. And we're beginning to see that uh, what we have here is a very, very low contrast surface, uh, although we are starting to see hints uh, in this region, for instance, of a little bit of contrast. We may be seeing hints here of a rather large crater, uh, although this is pretty speculative at this point because we have very little information. Uh, you can see a brightening in this area and then uh, darkening in this area, and this may be telling us that uh, this will be the first impact crater that we see on the surface of Umbriel. From the Image Processing Lab, I'm Bill Griffith. Voyager 2's closest approach to Uranus is now a little more than 16 hours away. It occurs at 10 tomorrow morning, Pacific Standard Time. The six hours before and two hours after that will be the most crucial. That's when Voyager 2 will record its highest resolution pictures <coughs> excuse me, and other science data. Project scientist Ed Stone is with me again. Ed, uh, what are your predictions, if you have any? <laughs> or what are your hopes, if you don't well, have predictions? Well, I, I, have, I have hopes that all of the things we have planned, in fact, execute exactly as we have them planned, because everything we've been doing to date has really been a prologue for the next 24 hours, because that is the primary scientific return will occur in the next 24 hours. Now, all of it won't come back t uh, tomorrow, because some of it is put on a tape recorder, but that is the period when, in fact, it's all recorded. And uh, the... Will all of the instruments be used? I presume everything on there every, is going to be used. Yes, every single instrument will be used. Uh, uh, the instruments on the scan platform will be studying the planet at the closest, res highest resolution. Uh, the, they'll be studying the rings at the highest resolution and the satellites at the highest resolution. The other instruments, which sense the uh, magnetosphere and the particles trapped in the magnetosphere and the waves, will finally be within the planetary magnetic field for the first time. And then we'll use the radio system on the spacecraft itself to probe the atmosphere and the rings via the occultation technique. As we go behind it. As we go behind the yes. point of view of Earth. Uh, I, we've talked earlier in the program about how much we've changed the spacecraft since it left Saturn before it got to Uranus. Have we made any changes since we got near Uranus based on what we've seen at Uranus? Well, we've, we've uh, yes, in fact, one of the images that's coming down in the next 24 hours is an image of uh, 1985 U1, which was just recently discovered. And we have reprogrammed uh, that pati one particular image from Miranda to that new satellite. Uh, and we're also doing some fine adjustments later this evening, which will tune up the pointing for the most critical observations at the time of closest approach. What kind of adjustments are these? Well, they're, they're final uh, pointing adjustments so when we get the best possible information as to where the spacecraft is with respect to Miranda, which is our closest approach. And uh, we put in the instructions in the computer so that it will, in fact, uh, have our best targeting on Miranda. That has to be done pretty much at the, at the last minute because of the data still coming in as to where everything is. That's right. I think the commands actually go up uh, sometime like 1 o'clock uh, this morning Pacific Standard Time. Calling a little close. Yes, it is. And what, uh, what do you anticipate anything particularly different in the 
fields around the hint of the magnetic field, is that going to make a, a particular large difference between this measurement and those near Jupiter and Saturn? Well, I think uh, in any case the magnetic field is going to be different because it, it will be tipped, uh, likely tipped on its side just like the planet. So we'll be going in from the pole of the magnetic field. Uh, there could be a very, uh, very uh, intensive uh, radiation environment if some of our earlier indications are correct. And, uh, but on the other hand, we just have no idea. This is really a, a unique magnetosphere. Also, there, I've heard that it's possible that uh, we may be getting more indications of magnetic field once we get around behind the planet than we are from out in front of it. Well, there, there may well be a magnetotail. One would expect that the solar wind, which uh, uh, essentially blows out from the sun, will deform the planetary field into a long tail-shaped structure. And as we go behind the planet, we will uh, enter into and probe the tail region of the magnetic field. Um, the satellites, are, are there any others besides any of the new ones we're going to be looking at deliberately besides the... No, that's the only one that we'll be uh, particularly uh, trying to image. In, but we'll be getting pictures of the rings and perhaps satellites in there, even though we don't even know they exist. Yet. Yes, we'll be certainly looking for di additional shepherding satellites. Thank you very much, Ed. Well, today we've seen uh, quite a bit of new information. We found some new satellites along the way. We have today some evidence for a magnetic field and associated with the planet Uranus. We've seen a number of clouds moving in the upper atmosphere and the haze around the South Pole and uh, the first hint of perhaps some sort of features, maybe even geologic formations, on the major moons. Tomorrow, closest approach day, a day during which we expect to gather more information about the planet Uranus and its satellites and its rings, more than in the 205 years since its discovery. Also, the day that Voyager 2's trajectory will be changed by Uranus gravity as it swings around Uranus and Voyager will be placed on a course to its next destination, the planet Neptune. It will reach Neptune August 24th, 1989, after traveling another 1.2 billion miles. I'm Al Hibbs of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. We we'll hope you'll join us tomorrow as we continue to watch Voyager 2 spacecraft's encounter with the planet Uranus.